Everybody good this morning? Yeah. Kind of? Sort of? Okay. All right. Um, I got to tell you, I, I, there are times, th- I, I, this is going to sound like I'm griping, and I'm not. I'm really not. Uh, and I know any time that, um, that you hear somebody uh, say, Tom, I just saw Jordan go out in the lobby. I need him to come back in here real quick. Can you go grab him for me? Thank you. This is going to be really weird on her YouTube channel, but y'all stick with me, all right? Um, I know that any time somebody says, I'm not griping, you're like, yes, you are. So, but I'm really not griping. Uh, but just, man, the, 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 first, the first song that we sang uh, this morning, you know, you have turned, how's it go? You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. Has anybody experienced that? Have you experienced God doing some good stuff and taking some seemingly not good, maybe even miserable stuff in your life, and somehow, some way, maybe you didn't even see it at the time, you turn back and look at it now and go, okay, now I see how he's done something really good with that. Does that happen to anybody? Has that happened to anybody? It's happened to me. And, and I told you guys several months ago, I remember a youth minister talking one time about, you know, the song that we sing sometimes that he has made me glad. That we, we talk about, I'm, I'm entering his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. He has made me glad. And we've seen that with the most stoic, somber faces we possibly can. Yes, he has. He has made me glad, yes. And that's how we sing it. And with, with as, as much non-griping as I can, I kind of felt this morning, and maybe it's the first song, and it's, man, we didn't get enough sleep because it's, it's daylight saving started today and all that. We just kind of... I don't know that all of us had our, had our morning turned into dancing this morning. I don't know that we all had our, our sorrow turned into joy. Now, the teenagers did a fantastic job because they sung that song at camp, at youth rallies, all the time. Probably sick of it by now, aren't you? Am I right? No. Awesome. Great. Good. Because they've learned over you know, these different experiences that you can actually physically turn your body, and it helps you realize, God has turned my morning into dancing. The sorrow that I was feeling is now happiness. And so we're going to sing that song. I didn't even tell the praise team this ahead of time. We're going to sing that song again. That's why I had to chase you down, Jordan. And we're going we're to stand together. We're going to sing it like God has done good things in our lives. Has he done something good in your life? Then what I want you to do, I know some of you are like, I'll break a hip if I turn in a circle. I understand. (laughs) But at least let's sing with some excitement, with some smiles on our faces. Clap, raise your hands, turn in a circle. If you're confused what you should do, look at a teenager nearby or the ones down here, and we're going to sing this song together. We're going to celebrate what God has done in our lives. Can we do that? All right, let's do it. Praise team lead us, please. Your light broke Go through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. There we go. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned. My morning into dancing, you have turned my sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up, I stand on higher ground. Your praise rose in my heart, made this valley see. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. 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 
This is how we over you have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy You have turned My morning into dancing You have turned My sorrow into joy This is how we This is how we overcome. 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 Whoo, that was better. Some of you are like, ah, oh, I went to church and sweated today. Holy cow. And, you know, I always blame it on the teenagers. I'm going to apologize to y'all right now because I always blame it on the teenagers. But the adults did it too where you start doing that. This is how we overcome. Everybody's clapping. You just get faster. You can't help yourself. We're not on rhythm anymore. We just clap it. We were all doing it. Thank you for doing that this morning. I hope that that's not just something fun that we did on a Sunday morning during church. I hope that you can approach this week going, you know, maybe everything's not going my way. Maybe I got some bad news. Maybe I'm struggling with some things. But my God has the ability and the power and the desire to turn the things that I'm struggling with into things that I'm celebrating. And I hope you find ways to allow that to happen this week. I hope you find ways to encourage somebody else to allow that to happen this week. We're starting a, a new series today. We're talking about things that, that um, Jesus said. And, and I thought, you know, to share with you, sometimes, you know, we, we have these people that get in front of cameras and get on social media and they say things and, and maybe they wish that they could take some of those things back. Maybe it's the nervousness of being in front of the camera or a microphone being put in their face. But sometimes celebrities, famous people say some really dumb things. I mean, we say dumb things too. But there's some things that people that we look to for either wisdom or, or just, you know, because they're celebrities, because they're movie stars, musicians, and politicians, and leaders, that we think everything that they're going to say is going to be something that's just, just so wonderful and intelligent and, and awe-inspiring. And it isn't always. And there's sometimes when, we, when people, uh, you know, again, just calling them celebrities, just kind of a blanket label of celebrities, will say something and you, you read about it on Twitter and social media, you see it on TV and you're like, whoa, did they really just say that? Let me give you a few examples. There was an actor that did an interview, I'm not going to give you names, did an interview back in, in 1965 who said, I don't think there's anything particularly wrong about hitting a woman. An open-handed slap is justified if all, other, if all other alternatives fail. And there has been plenty of warning. Now, as soon as I read that first statement, some of you are like, what? Right? What? Who, what? Did he just, he just said that. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, this, is a, this is a celebrity. This is a musician who had gotten in trouble with the law and been kind of uh, criticized for some of the choices he'd been making. He said, all of a sudden... You're like the Bin Laden of America. Osama Bin Laden is the only one who knows what I'm going through. <laughs> really? What? Wait, what? Yeah. This is, this is one that got, I mean, this, this quote is probably 20 years old from this particular uh, female musician who said, Whenever I watch TV and I see those poor, starving kids all over the world, I can't help but cry. I mean, I love to be skinny like that, but not with all those flies and death and stuff. Really? Okay. Maybe you remember the 2007 Miss Teen USA pageant. Y'all remember this poor girl who got asked the question, a fifth of Americans can't locate the U.S. on a map. Why do you think that is? Do y'all remember... Her answer, bless her heart. I think she was just nervous. It wasn't a question she was expecting. Here's her answer. 
I personally believe that U.S. Americans are unable to do so because uh, some uh, people out there in our nation don't have maps. And uh, I believe that our education, like such as in South Africa and uh, Iraq, everywhere like such as, and I believe that our education, oh, sorry, I skipped a line. And I believe that they should, our education over here in the U.S. should help the U.S., uh, or uh, should help South Africa and should help the Iraq and the Asian countries so we'll be able to build up our future for our children. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Now, <laughs> you could probably, I mean, Google stuff, you'll find all sorts of th dumb things that people said. You can think of dumb things that you said or, or, or things that you're passing by somebody's office uh, where you're working at or somebody's cubicle or, and, and, you, and you hear somebody say something like, well, did I just hear what I think I heard? Pass by your kid's room sometimes or kind of eavesdrop on some of their conversations. You know, you're like, what, really? That's what, and maybe they're doing the same thing to you, by the way. Because there's all sorts of times in our lives when, when somebody says something and, and we, we think, did I mishear that? Or it's just odd, it's weird. And we say to ourselves, what? What was that? Now, keep that in mind. Let's think about some of the sayings of Jesus. Let's think about some of the things that Jesus said. I mean, we would never say, well, whoa, wait a second, Jesus. To some of the things that he said, Right? I mean, if you look in your Bibles, you got the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four contain lots of words that Jesus said. They contain the story of his life here on this earth, the things that he preached, the miracles that he did, all sorts of things like that. And you can read through all those and you can find all sorts of wonderful things that Jesus said that we love to hear. When Jesus says things like, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Man, I love hearing that. Your sins are forgiven. Yes, please. Let the little children come to me. Sometimes I don't agree with you, Jesus, but okay. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that a great thing to hear? As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And we hear those things, and we see those kind of quotes, and we feel encouraged by them. We want to take hold of them and claim them and just say, yes, give me more of that. That's my Savior. And I love to hear those words. But what about the things that Jesus said that are more difficult for us to hear? What about the things that we have maybe a hard time understanding? Or what about the things they said? It's, it's not that we have a hard time understanding them. We just have a hard time believing them. What about the things, it's not the, that we don't understand or don't believe them, it's just, man, that's going to be really challenging if I actually have to do that. That's going to stretch me a little bit. That's going to move me out of my comfort zone. What about, the, what about the statements that Jesus said that make us go, wait, what? And that's what we're talking about. That's what we're going to start talking about this morning. That's what we're going to talk about for the next several weeks. And, and honestly, looking at some things that, that Jesus said that we... When it comes right down to it, we kind of wish he hadn't said them. Not because, like some of these celebrity quotes I talked about, that we think that they're, they're dumb or they're offensive in any way, but because maybe it's just something that we don't get it. I, don't, I do not understand what you're trying to say. And I'm reading through Jesus' words. I'm three, reading through my Bible or my Bible app, and I come across something that Jesus said. I'm like, wait, I don't get that. So we're going to talk about a couple of those statements. Or maybe we, we're reading the words of Jesus and we're trying to, to soak in what he's trying to say. And, and it's not that we don't understand it. We just don't want to hear it. That's a struggle. I, I, I really wish he hadn't said those things. I really wish he hadn't said it that way. I really wish he hadn't, he hadn't laid out that challenge. Those are the things we're going to be talking about for the next several weeks. Because I think that there are things that Jesus said that we honestly wish he wouldn't have said. And, and it's things that, that we wish he wouldn't have said because... You know, they're confusing, or, they're confusing or, or don't fit in our in our context, or they're just challenging. And if that's where you are this morning, if there's some things, maybe you just don't know a whole lot of, of the words of Jesus, then that's fine too. But if there's some things you come across as you've read through Scripture, and you're thinking to yourself, I wish he hadn't said that, or hadn't said it that way, or I wish I didn't have to do what it was that he said, you're not alone. 
Even his own disciples that were with him when he was here on this earth felt the exact same way. If you got your Bibles, you can open in your Bibles or your Bible apps to John chapter 6. It's in the New Testament. The fourth book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 6. Jesus spends John, he, he, he spends the bulk of, of John chapter 6 calling himself and talking about himself as being the bread of life. And it's, it's an awesome illustration about talk, that Jesus is using to talk about how, you know, we need bread, we need sustenance to stay alive. And he's talking about from a spiritual context, you need me in your life. You need to participate in me. You need to have a connection with me. But in the process of talking about that, he says, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, part of that is Jesus alluding to what we've already done this morning, taking communion together, remembering the body of Jesus that he gave on the cross, remembering the blood that he shed that washes us clean, and that we need to participate in that. But it goes beyond just communion. Jesus is talking about, I want you to fully Live in connection and relationship with me. If we're not connected with each other, you can't have life. You can't survive. But when he talks about eating flesh and drinking blood, the people that he's talking to, his disciples included, think that he's talking about cannibalism. They think he's saying, you're going to have to just come take a chunk out of me and eat it. And that's kind of bothersome to them. And it says in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, well, does this offend you? And he goes on to say, I'm going to say some things that may be even more offensive. And if you keep on reading, as he continues to talk, some of these disciples just turn around and go, done, I'm out, and just walk away. But in essence, if you look at their question, or when you say, you know, who can accept this, they're in essence saying, wait a second, what are you saying, Jesus? Well, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I, let, let's go back to the, let's talk about the good stuff. Let's talk about grace and forgiveness, and let's do some more miracles or something. This is too difficult, and I, I don't, I don't want a part of it. And they walk away. I'll give you another example. If you go back a couple of books from the book of John to the book of Mark. And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus has been going through his ministry and he's been healing people. He's been teaching things. And he turns around and he asks his disciples, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about who I actually am. Who are people saying that I am? And they name off, you know, some people say you're this prophet or that prophet. Or some people say you're this guy, John the Baptist, has come back from the dead. And he goes, okay, well, let's forget about other people. Who do you say I am? And Peter steps forward and says, Jesus, you're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're the one that, as I grew up hearing prophecies that, about the Messiah that was going to come and rescue God's people, I think that you're him. And Jesus is so moved by, by Peter's statement. He says, man, it's a great answer. And this is the foundational truth of my church. This is what we're going to found my church on, that I am the Christ. And then he goes on from there and starts talking to disciples and says basically, okay, now here's what's going to happen next. The religious leaders, the, the preachers, the teachers, the religious people in our community are going to end up grabbing a hold of me. And, you know, they're going to arrest me. They're going to put me on trial. They're going to beat me. And they're going to end up killing me. And I'm going to die. And then three days later, I'm going to rise again. Peter, same guy who just said, I believe you're the Christ, hears this and has an issue with it. And I don't know if it's just one of those things where it just didn't fit with Peter's picture of who the Messiah was and what the Messiah was going to do. Or if Peter was going, you know, Jesus, we're still trying to get disciples and this is not, this is not good recruiting material. Hey, come join us. Our master's going to die. You don't want to do that. You don't want to talk about the religious leaders capturing you and killing you. They will actually do it. Let's not put the thought in their heads. Whatever it was, whatever problem Peter had with it, in that moment when Jesus is saying those things, Peter basically says, whoa, what? And it says in Mark chapter 8 and verse 32, Jesus is speaking plainly about these things. He's not using metaphors and parables. He's just saying, here's what's going to happen. And Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him, begins to get on to him. Jesus stops saying that. Jesus, you don't, you don't need to be saying things like that. 
And the reason I show you that and the reason I show you John chapter 6 is because I want you to understand it's okay for us to question sometimes the words of Jesus. And to go, wait a second, why did you say that? Or even to say, man, I really wish you hadn't said that. Not that we don't believe it to be true. Not that we don't believe that Jesus, what Jesus, who Jesus was and what he said was real. We just struggle with it sometimes. And if you struggle with it sometimes, it's okay. So did the eyewitnesses. So did his very disciples that had more conversations with him than anyone else. Who would often go with him and go, okay, uh, now we're off by ourselves. Jesus, that story you told, awesome. Don't get it. Can you explain it to me? Let's talk about something that we wish Jesus hadn't said. Go, go one page over in the book of Mark to Mark chapter 9. Let's look at this text real quick in Mark chapter 9. Begin verse 43. Here's what Jesus has to say. If your hand causes you to stumble... Cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with, two hands to go, uh, than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Basically, Jesus says that there's a part of your body that is causing you to make ungodly choices, then whatever appendage is causing that problem, lop it off. Poke it out. Does anybody else struggle with reading this? I do. And, and, when you, and maybe this is one of the first times, if, if, you don't, if you haven't read through this before, maybe this is one of the first times you've heard Jesus say something like this. And the guy that's saying, you know, that is preaching forgiveness and grace and mercy is talking about lopping off body parts. And it makes some of us, myself included, go, wait a minute. What are we talking about here? If, if, if I'm doing something that God doesn't want me to do, and if I'm going somewhere that God doesn't want me to go, and if I'm looking at something God doesn't want me to look at, then the best thing for me to do is cut off whatever body part it is that's causing the problem. Seriously? I wish Jesus hadn't said that. I wish Jesus hadn't talked about removing body parts because they're causing a problem. Now, I don't believe that Jesus is talking here about literally cutting off body parts. Although, if you go back and, and, and look in history, in ancient history, the first, I don't know, several decades after the church began, uh, there were some Christians that took this literally and were taking off appendages that they felt like were causing problems. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. I don't think Jesus is going, every church service, let's get together and let's get stuff out and let's start cutting things. I don't think that's what he's looking for. However, I think Jesus is addressing an issue that many of us struggle with. With our, with our bad habits, with, with, the, with the repeating sin, with the, with, the, with the addictions, the bad relationships, the struggles with, with anger, or other attitudes. Jesus is, is addressing those repetitive sins, those things that keep being a problem for us. And we keep going back to them again and again. And he's also addressing the tendency for some of us, myself included, to rationalize our sin. And to say things like, you know, it's no big deal. It's just this once. Okay, I know I said it was just that once, but now it's just this one more time. As long as I don't get caught, it's not really bad, right? Jesus is addressing the mindset of those of us who may not be taking our own sin very seriously. And this isn't about, this isn't about looking at somebody else and judging someone else's actions going, boy, they, they really should straighten up. Boy, they really should quit making those choices. This is about us looking ourselves in the mirror and being honest with ourselves about us and about our own sins, about our own, about our own actions, about our own heart, and trying to start seriously living the way that Jesus calls us to. 
And again, one of the reasons that I look at this scripture, one of the reasons that I wish Jesus hadn't said this is not nearly about the removal of appendages. It's about what it's going to require of me if I do what he's calling me to do. Does that make sense? This is why I wish he hadn't said it. I love him saying things about love and forgiveness and grace and mercy and healing and life. But when he holds up the mirror and says, hey, how serious are you being about the choices that you're making? <laughs> Let's just put that mirror down, Jesus. Let's not have that conversation. I wish he hadn't said it. I wish he hadn't brought it up. Because now I have to deal with it. There's a couple of things that I see in this text that I need to do about my sin, about the temptations that I struggle with. And one of those things is I need to start getting serious about it. I need to get serious about my sin. And nothing's going to change until I get serious about making a change. And I can wish things were different. I can wish things that were, were not going the way that they were. I can wish that I wasn't dealing with the consequences that I'm dealing with. I can regret my mistakes. I can wish that I wasn't dealing with all the consequences that I'm going through. But I'm still going to have to struggle through and deal with the fact I'm not making any changes. I'm not doing anything different until I get serious about my sin and about my temptation, about what's leading me to go back to these choices again, to go back to that attitude again. Until I get serious about that, nothing's ever going to change. I can rationalize it. I can say it's not a big deal. I can say I can handle it. I can say, well, other people are worse off than me. I can come up with all sorts of reasons because I'm not ready to get serious about it yet. The Apostle Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 34. He tells the, the Corinthian church, come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning. Get your mind right and get serious about making a change. And until, I, until I'm ready to, to, to fully commit, until I'm ready to fully get serious about making a change, it's just words. It's just wishful thinking. I've got to get serious about it. And the second thing that I see in this text when Jesus talks about your eye and your foot and your hand causing problems, getting rid of them, get serious about your sin. The second thing is get drastic about it. Get drastic about it. Let's go back and look again. Look at, look at the words that he uses. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Those are drastic measures. Would you agree? Those are drastic measures. And again, I don't think that Jesus is talking literally about cutting off body parts, but I do believe that the point that he's trying to make is that nothing is going to be different in my life unless I'm willing to make significant changes, not just, not just get serious about those and go, man, I really want to do this, but to actually do something and to do something drastic, to do something significant, maybe even getting rid of something that causes me a problem, maybe walking away from a person or a friendship or a relationship that continually leads me to making destructive choices. I gotta get drastic. I gotta cut some things off. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, let's talk about that real quick and we'll be done this morning. Let's talk about how we get drastic. Let's talk about how we cut some things off that may be causing a problem, okay? Quick steps. First thing I gotta do, I gotta identify the root of the problem. What's at the source of this? What's really causing this? If I, have, if, if I continually keep losing my temper, if I continually keep having these bouts of, of anger and resentment, I need to know what's causing that in the first place. What are the circumstances that are causing me to be angry? And maybe it's something from way distant past. Maybe it's something that happened yesterday. Whatever it is, I need to get to the root of the problem and address that first. There may be some help I need to get with that. Or I may need to have a conversation with somebody and allow some, some, some forgiveness, some reconciliation to take place. But I need to know what the source of the problem is. If I have an addiction to pornography, if I can't stop myself from looking at things on my phone or on my computer screen that I shouldn't be looking at, then I need to identify what is causing me to go to those things. What is it in my life? Is it boredom? Is it... Is it Something going on in my own marriage? Is it what, what is at the source of this? Why do I keep going back to this over and over again? If I've got an issue with alcohol and drugs, what's leading me to those things? What is the draw? When is it that I feel most inclined to go back to that addiction again? If, I'm, if I struggle with gossip, I can't help myself from wanting to hear what everybody else is doing and tell it to somebody else. Why is that? 
Is that upbringing? Is it habit? Is it, is it self-esteem? What is it that's causing me? What's at the root of that that's causing me to go do that? If I'm going to get serious about making a change, get drastic now and make that change, then I need to be aware of what the root of the problem is. I need to recognize it ahead of time so that I can be ready to deal with it when the time comes. In the Old Testament, thousands of years ago, there was a guy named Job. And Job says in Job chapter 31 and verse 1, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. I don't know how old Job was when he made this covenant, this promise, this contract with his eyes. But I want you to see what Job is saying here. Job recognized ahead of time, I'm going to be tempted to have sex with another woman that's not my wife. And I also recognize that the root of the problem is looking at that woman in the first place. And so if I recognize that that's the root of the problem, what am I going to do? I'm not going to look at her. I'm going to deal with the root of the problem. I'm going to deal with that so that the sin doesn't happen. Does that make sense? Identify the root of the problem first. For some of us, that may be the people that we're around. It may be the music that we listen to. It may be what we watch on our phones and tablets and TVs. It may be just what, where our minds go when we're all by ourselves. It may be when we're stressed. It may be when we're depressed. But what is the source I, I might even need to get some professional help with it. Okay, let's identify it. Let's figure it out and let's deal with it. Jesus says we need to get drastic. Let's get drastic. Let's get serious and, and find the source of the problem first. Second thing I need to do is change my environment. If I keep having a problem in this particular place or with this particular person, why do I keep returning to this particular place or spending time with this particular person? I have a friend that, that uh, is an avid hunter, and years ago, he was turkey hunting. He's in this big, uh, big patch of land somewhere in Missouri, and um, he, he, he was hunting turkey, and I, I don't know all the details, but in, on, on this part of this farm, this land that he was on, there was an old kind of rotted out section of chain link fence. There used to be a long you know, chain link fence there, and there was just kind of pieces of it that were left. And this turkey, he came upon this turkey who had been trying to run away from him and got its head through one of the holes of the chain link fence and just kept trying to run through it. And it stuck, and, and he's turkey hunting, and he literally walked over and got a hold of this turkey. He, he, as he hunted, he didn't have to shoot the thing. He just grabbed it with his own hands. Now, he, he ended up going, you know, that's not very sporting, and he let it go. But he, he just kind of stood there for a minute going, here's this turkey that has the ability to fly away, to run in a different direction, to do something different than what it's doing right now. But it's got its head in that hole, and it just keeps running forward. He says the dumbest looking thing in the world. Its legs are going like crazy. Its neck sticking through, and it's not getting anywhere. I find myself being that turkey sometimes. I'll do the same thing in knowing that if, if I go to that place, if I talk with that person, if I click on that website, if I go to that store, if I stay in that friendship, that relationship, I know what's going to happen, and I'm going to regret it. But I click anyway. I go sit down next to that person anyway. I go through the door anyway. I'm going to get the same results. I'm going to have the same regret if I don't change my environment. Jesus says, if I know that you fill in the blank, whatever it is, that that thing is a problem for me, I need to cut it off. I need to do something different. I need to make a change. Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, stay away from every kind of evil. Get away from it. Run from it. Avoid it at all costs. If you know this particular thing or being around this particular person is going to be a problem, is going to cause me to do ungodly things, then get away from it. Don't stay anywhere near it. 
Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, Solomon says, walk with wise, become wise, associate with fools, and get into trouble. I may need to stop dating this particular person that I'm dating. I may need to avoid being around that friend. I may need to unfriend somebody or stop following somebody on social media because I see how that connection is causing me to make bad choices. And I may have even tried to rationalize it. I'm going to be the good person. I'm going to be the example of them. And if I take a really honest look at myself, it hasn't happened. And more often than not, they've caused me to do something that I regret later. Why do I keep going back to it again? Change your environment. Change the circumstances. Cut something off if it needs to be cut off. I may have to end a friendship. I may have to limit some, some interactions with a certain person. I may have to eliminate some activities from my schedule or, or change some things around you know, my office, my home. I may have to completely alter a part of my lifestyle. But if it'll save my marriage, if it'll save that friendship, if it'll, if it'll save my connection with my kids, if it'll save my job, if it'll save my health, if it will save my soul, I need to do it. I need to make the change, whatever it is. And the last thing, I need to get rid of the junk. I need to identify the root of the problem. I need to change my environment if necessary. And I need to get rid of the junk, get rid of the problem, get rid of whatever it is that's even left over from choices that I used to make. I've told this church family multiple times about a lady that we used to go help uh, years ago when I was doing youth ministry. We'd go to, to Duluth, Minnesota, and the city close to Duluth is called Two Harbors. And there was a lady there, uh, all sorts of issues, health issues, uh, probably some mental or at least emotional issues that she was dealing with. And she was also a horrible hoarder. There was just filth all through her house. She had multiple pets. And there was pet dander and other pet stuff everywhere. And there was trash everywhere. And there was, it just, uh, ugh, it was just gross. And we would go every year back to this woman's house. And it would look about the same as when we were there the year before. And there was stuff that we would be piling up and we'd have trash bags. And we'd, and we'd collect just armloads of stuff and we're throwing it in the trash bags. And she would come along behind us going, no, 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 I, I need that. I'm still going to use that. I want to keep that. And, and so there were times where we'd like, okay, and we'd pull it out. And then when she got distracted, we'd, you know, or, you know, we'd send somebody off in her room. We'd shut the door so she couldn't see what we were throwing away. We'd throw away as much as we could. Just junk that she was holding on to. Because she was convinced that she still needed it. She still wanted it. And there was so much of that stuff that we, we desperately wanted to say, this is trash. Get rid of it. But she wanted to hold on to it. And, and I share that with you because this is really, that's really at the core of what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying there's something in your life that's not of me. That's not who I want you to be. That's not part of who I am. And yet you keep holding on to it. And it's causing guilt and it's causing frustration and it's causing bad health and it's causing bad spiritual health. Your life could be so much better if you just turn loose of it. But I've gotten used to it. It's, it's normal. It's safe. It's secure. It's, it's who I am. When Joshua is talking to God's people, when they're coming into a new promised land and going to live a brand new life, they've had centuries of worshiping other gods besides Almighty God. And one of the things that Joshua says to them as they get ready to go into this land in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 23, he says, Now then, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord the God of Israel. There's something else, Joshua says, has been owning your heart this whole time. Throw it away. Get rid of it. Chunk it. Let it go. There are some people in this room that desperately need to do that this morning. It may not be your hand or your foot or your eye. It may be your phone, your tablet. It may be your bank account. 
maybe your status in the community. Maybe drugs, maybe alcohol, maybe resentment. It's not just that you aren't letting go of it. You are not helping it to let go of you. It's got a hold. And you got to cut it off. You got to get rid of it. Or it's never going to go away. You guys have done an outstanding job of listening this morning. I want to show you a quick video clip and we'll be done. Okay? And I want you to see what happens to us through the eyes of Jesus when we hold on to our junk. Hey, Kat. Jesus. Oh, it's been a long time. Yeah, um, I didn't expect to see you here. Whoa, uh, what's that smell? The smell? Oh, um, well, that's my trash. I just, I'm a little embarrassed about it. Oh, well, is that why you've been avoiding me? Avoiding you? I, I, I haven't really been avoiding you. I just, you know, I don't, I don't want to get close to you. I mean, I, I just, I don't want you to smell it. I'll take it, Kat. Come oh, on. Oh, no, 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 no. That's okay. I mean, I made it. It's my trash. You know, I should carry it. It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah, but Kat, I mean, this is my job. Right. I take people's trash. That's what I do, so. Right, okay. Well, maybe I could go and just clean it up a little bit, you know, and then I'll just, I'll come back. No, Kat, I don't need you to do that. Um. Okay, I'll take it from you so you don't have to carry the weight. Oh, well, I. Come on. Uh, oh. Just, just hand it over. Uh, all, right? all right, let go. Let go. Yes, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, How's that feel? Weird. Wow. That is crazy. Yeah, just loosen it up a Whoa, little bit. check that out. I don't know if I've ever moved like that before. Well, I mean, that is crazy. I just, I feel so free and alive. I, it's I mean, the lack of trash. Wow, I mean, it's just like, this is the craziest feeling I have ever had. I just, it's like something's missing, you know? Well, I, I just, um, get used I, to feeling free, because that's yeah, what you are now. Right, okay. Uh, what okay. are you doing? I just, I gotta get one thing, okay? Hold on just a minute Get here. one thing? No, 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 don't thank open you. the bag! Jesus, thank you so much for your sacrifice. I really appreciate all that you've done for me. What's going on here, Kat? What? Look, I'll take the trash, but you need to put that back. Oh, um, no, actually, um, that's okay. This is mine. It's my piece. I want to keep it. No, it goes right back in the bag, so I'll help you. Here, no, 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 put no, it no. here. No, Jesus, I, I need to remind myself not to make more trash. I mean, that just Kathleen, makes sense. Kathleen, I will remind you not to make more trash, oh, okay? Oh, well, Jesus, you know... That's what I do. I mean, we'll walk together. I know, but I should be in a better place than this by now. I mean, I just... I'm constantly doing things wrong, you know, and I, I'm just, I'm constantly letting you down. No, the only thing that's letting me down is, is, is you taking the stuff back. Okay. Look, I took care of the trash before you even created it. Oh. Look, don't you see what's happening? Every time I take your trash away, you come back and, and take another piece. And the more pieces you carry around, the more trash you attract. It reeks. Cat. When I look at you, I don't see your sin. I see you, the real you, the free you. This is what I'm fighting for. This is what I died for. Jesus, I'm sorry. I just, please forgive me. I've already forgiven you. The question is, will you forgive yourself? These addictions, these habits, this debt, this resentment, this depression, this guilt, this need to fit in, this, this need to measure up, these failures, they're weighing some of us down. And they're exhausting. And they stink. And they keep us from living the life of freedom that my God wants all of us to experience. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. It's time to cut off some things that have been a problem for a while. It's time to let go of the trash. It's time to get serious and get drastic and let him set us free. 
and he'll do it if we want him to. So we're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song together. And I invite you while we're standing and while we're singing, if there is something in your life that you have struggled with, that you keep holding on to, or that keeps holding on to you, and you want to be done with it, feel free to come share that with us this morning. There's no judgment here. There's nothing but love and grace. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ where he can set you free from all that junk, he can cut all that stuff off with the power of his blood, that can happen today too, if you want it to. Let us know how we can help. Please come forward if you need to while we stay in the same.